In this lecture, we'll be examining what one might call the southern fronts. The uh, battles around the Mediterranean, uh, battles involving Turkey, Italy, and the Balkans. We'll examine the factors that made victory, or a decisive victory, elusive in this theater of war as well, as on the other fronts. Turkish entry into the war expanded its scope. We'll discuss the Allied landings in Gallipoli in 1915, which attempted to strategically revolutionize the situation, but which were repulsed by the Turks in a campaign that involved a million men on all sides. We'll examine the way in which Italy at first stayed out of the general war following a policy of sacred egoism, as it was called by Italian politicians, and we'll observe how secret diplomacy and promises of territorial gains finally would bring Italy into the war on the Allied side as a result of the secret Treaty of London of 1915. We'll examine the hybrid forms of warfare that evolved as a result, the Alpine high-altitude fighting in the mountain ranges between Austria-Hungary and Italy, and the 12 battles of the Isonzo. We'll examine how Germany and Austria-Hungary succeeded in overrunning Serbia and Romania. And we'll finally take a closer look at an attempt to find a back door in terms of the southern fronts, the 1915 Allied expedition to Salonika, Greece, and the reasons why it proved indecisive. We'll begin by examining the widening of the war with Turkish entry. The war took on a southern dimension by the addition of operations in the Ottoman Empire, or Turkey, warfare in Italy, and operations around the Mediterranean. Turkey joined the Central Powers by a secret treaty of August 2, 1914, but was slower to join the active fighting. The Young Turk movement, the nationalist movement for uh, inner renewal that had gained steam in the empire and had controlled it since 1909, led by Enver Pasha, had sympathized with Germany and increasingly come under the influence of German advisors and German politicians. The entry of Turkey into the war came when two German battleships, which were in essence given to the Turkish Navy, and their, uh, their soldiers changed out for uh, German uh, sailors uh, replacing their uniforms with Turkish ones and hoisting the Turkish flag, when these two battleships, the Goeben and the Breslau, moved into the Black Sea and began shelling Russian, uh, the Russian port of Odessa in October 1914. Uh, the result confused the Allies, who still thought that diplomatically they might have a chance to keep uh, the Ottoman Empire out of the war, but on November of 1914, the Allies, too, declared war on Turkey. As a result, operations would now spread around the territories of the Turkish Empire in the Mediterranean and in the Middle East. A key place or geopolitical location, which in this regard took on tremendous importance, was the Dardanelles. The Dardanelles represents essentially where, one might say, Asia and Europe meet. They are the straits which uh, join the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. And as such, they are a crucial strategic location, especially for the Russians. Because for the Russians, this was also a channel of trade. A third of Russian exports went through the Dardanelles, and the Dardanelles had been a long-standing coveted place that the Russian uh, policymakers over generations had sought to control so that they might have a uh, have this crucial strategic location in their own control. In the context of this renewed war effort, Great Britain, which over generations had sought to frustrate Russian ambitions to seize the Dardanelles, now in essence discarded this earlier constant aim of its diplomacy and promised Russia the Dardanelles as a gain of the war if it came to a successful conclusion. The stakes were thus high and growing higher. Turkey, for its part, launched an attack on the Russian Empire in the Caucasus mountain range. Some Turkish politicians, especially the nationalistic young Turks, envisioned as a result of victory in this war and the defeat of the Russian Empire, the possibility of carving out a great new empire that might replace the rickety Ottoman Empire, a new empire on a national basis. It would be what they called a pan-Turanian empire, meaning a pan-Turkish empire 
uniting all of the different speakers of Turkic languages and extending far into territories at that point owned by the Russian Empire in Central Asia, a vast new basis of a powerful state. Nonetheless, their ambitions were frustrated because the Turkish winter campaign of 1914 to 1915 into the Caucasus mountain ranges and their snowy valleys and peaks turned into a huge disaster. Untold numbers of Turkish soldiers froze to death as a result of poor provisioning and communications, and it's estimated that only 13% of the attacking force survived this assault. In the wake of this disaster, in the spring of 1915, Russian forces now moved over into the attack and moved down from the Caucasus into the territories of the Turkish Empire, into the Anatolian lands. There, in a turn of events that would be, as it turns out, quite significant later, they were welcomed by some ethnic minorities in these areas owned by the Ottoman Empire as liberators. Some of these groups were Armenians. The Armenians are an ethnic group different from the Turks. They were also Christian in background, and some felt that Russian rule would finally allow them a freer exercise of their religion and their culture. Turkish forces also opened another front by making attempts to attack the Suez Canal, which tremendously worried the British forces in Egypt. The Suez Canal, we need to recall, was essentially a lifeline for the British Empire to connect to its possession, the crown, uh, jewel in the crown, the Indian uh, lands uh, uh, through the Suez Canal. A final attempt at opening of a new ideological front, one might even say a religious front, came on November 14, when the Turkish Sultan, in his capacity as the Caliph, as the protector, the religious protector of the holy city of Mecca and protector of Muslims, declared holy war or jihad. He announced that it was the duty of all Muslims around the world to fight against the uh, imperialist powers of Britain, France, and Russia, and his hope was to set ablaze the many Muslim populations under British rule in India and Egypt, those under French rule in Africa or northern, uh, and Northern Africa, and in Central Asia against Russian rule. Now, the reality was that though this message was full of fire and of passion, it had very little resonance in fact, but it showed that many different factors were at play in this conflict. We need to turn now to a tremendously riveting example of an expedition which proceeded with high hopes, could certainly have made an enormous difference in the conflict as a whole, but which ended in a disaster. And this is the famous Gallipoli campaign. The Gallipoli campaign proceeded uh, as a result of a tremendous ambition. Now that Ottoman Turkey had entered the war and the Dardanelles were closed as a result, Communication with Russia had become more difficult. It was still possible to communicate through the northern uh, sea lanes, uh, but uh, it had become far harder to keep up communications and trade. To relieve Russia in this more difficult position, the Western allies, the British and the French, crafted plans that would knock Ottoman Turkey out of the war, seize the Dardanelles, and perhaps even open up the possibility of a back door to fight the central powers, Germany and Austria-Hungary, by invading through the Balkans and perhaps invading Austria-Hungary, carrying the war, in other words, right into the heart of enemy territory. The key to all of this was to gain a foothold close to the Dardanelles. And thus the plan began with the notion of a landing in Gallipoli, the peninsula at the tip of the Dardanelle Straits. Once a landing had been achieved there, it was hoped that allied armies might be able to then move up to invade uh, the rest of Turkish territory, occupy the capital of Constantinople to the northeast, and be in a position to strategically change the outcome of the war. This plan was championed uh, on the part of both the British and the French by those people who were called Easterners those who in the debate about how best to fight the war were convinced that there were other options in addition to slugging it out on the Western Front. 
and they proposed the attack upon Gallipoli, the opening up of the Dardanelles, the seizure of this territory as perhaps the decisive key to victory in the war. Among those champions was a man who would later play a very important role in world history, the British First Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill. The Gallipoli plan might very well, if it had succeeded in one of these great what-ifs, one of the hypotheticals of the conflict, might very well have changed the outcome of this conflict. And indeed, military historians who admire the sort of breadth of vision and ambition that the Gallipoli plan represented have sometimes called the Gallipoli campaign the only true strategic idea of the war the only truly revolutionary notion that might have changed its outcome. Unfortunately, bold as the plan was and high as the stakes were, the practice fell far short. Efforts to force the straits by battleships failed. And in fact, these first attacks ended up alerting Turkish forces that something larger was coming. The element of surprise was lost. Turkish forces, which earlier had not been... Uh, uh, in force in some of the areas that might have formed the target for a successful landing were now alerted to the fact that an attack was coming. They began to fortify, to build trenches, and to mass in great numbers to repel an assault that they now understood was coming. They did so under the leadership of Otto Liman von Sanders, uh, the German commander of a Turkish army which was defending Gallipoli. The major landing which unfortunately now had been, advance warning had been given of it to the uh, Turks, the major landing began on April 25th, 1915. French and British forces by sea uh, mounted an invasion and landed at Cape Helles, and Australian and New Zealand troops, popularly known as Anzac units, landed at Anzac Cove. They landed successfully, but due to confused orders, and just the confusion of the situation itself, uh, a lack of a sense of urgency on the part of commanders, we now see with perfect hindsight, an initial window of opportunity to turn these landings into expanded beachheads and to really secure a position, this opportunity was squandered. The Allied forces now discovered that Turkish troops were shooting down at them from positions atop the cliffs where they had dug in. And the Allied forces faced the obvious uh, uh, situation of having no alternative but to dig in themselves, to create trenches, and to fight it out. In a bizarre set of circumstances, a bizarre set of events, the result was that here at Gallipoli, one very nearly recreated the stasis, the deadlock, the trench warfare of the Western Front, but in hot, miserable conditions. Among the Turkish troops who were organizing the defense atop the cliffs and throwing back repeated attempts by the Allies to take the heights was a young officer, a young man by the name of Mustafa Kemal, who later, under the name of Ataturk, would become the leader of a new, revived nationalist Turkey that emerged after the First World War out of the ruins of the Ottoman Empire, was leading this defense. He, too, was a determined young Turk, and he was doing his part in the national defense. The entire dynamics of the long, drawn-out campaign, which left Allied forces essentially stranded at their initial beachheads, unable to expand them, unable to advance, once again provided a demonstration, if such a demonstration was needed, of the advantages of the defensive side that we've already talked about in an earlier lecture on the dynamics of the Western Front. The British commander of this uh, operation, Sir Ian Hamilton, renewed assaults in August of 1915, and new landings took place at Suvla Bay to the north of the initial landing spots. But these two did not succeed, and news of the disaster started to filter back to Britain. When it did so, Hamilton was removed, and through December, troops were withdrawn, quietly and in secret. Through subterfuge, through uh, uh, successful attempts to fool the Turkish forces uh, into thinking that the uh, Allied troops were still there in strength, the evacuation operation, in such complete contrast to the landings and the invasion itself, was remarkably successful and was finished by January 9th, 1916. But what of the outcome? 
What of the results that followed upon such ambitions for what this operation was supposed to bring? It's estimated that some 200,000 Allied men died in this futile expedition. The fighting had been of an enormous scale, reflecting the stakes. It had involved a million men on both sides, and the question now arose, who was to blame? One man in particular, who on the British side was blamed for having supported this venture to begin with, was Winston Churchill. He was disgraced. He was blamed for this misadventure, having supported it to begin with, and lost his position. Later, during the Second World War, he would go on to become the determined leader of the British war effort in the Second World War, but it would take his political career a long time to recover from this fatal association with the disaster of the invasion of Gallipoli. The Anzac troops, the Australian and New Zealand forces who had been shipped to participate in this fighting, had suffered enormous losses. And this was but of a piece with their tremendous sacrifices in the war as a whole. During the war, they took its estimated 62% casualties. The Gallipoli disaster, however, took, um, took on a special significance in the collective memory of Australians as well as New Zealanders of their participation in the First World War. The Gallipoli disaster came to be considered the founding experience of an independent Australian identity and New Zealand identity as well. The notion was that in this act of sacrifice, Australians and New Zealanders had shown themselves to be loyal sons of empire, yes, but also sticking together as comrades and as friends had revealed themselves to already be new nations that had a right to independence and a separate identity as well. Anzac Day, April 25th of every year, is still celebrated as a marker of precisely this searing experience in Australia. The Italian, what, the, uh, uh, what this failure also made clear uh, was that ultimately this had not proved to be the back door, the decisive strategic outcome. The failure made clear the decision would have to be reached elsewhere, probably on the Western Front. We want to pursue now events happening further west in the Mediterranean, and that is Italian participation in the war. When the First World War had broken out, Italy had announced that it was not bound to its obligations to the Central Powers as a result of the earlier Triple Alliance that it had participated in, and instead, Prime Minister Antonio Salandra insisted that Italy would follow what he called sacred egoism, a defense of its own interests and a waiting to see which side it might ultimately make most sense to adhere to. What resulted was uh, perhaps a not very noble performance as a bidding war grew up on both sides, um, by the central powers, that's to say Germany and Austria-Hungary, and by the Allies, uh, France, Great Britain, and Russia for the prize of Italian participation or neutrality. In this auction for Italian participation, the Allies ultimately were the winners. And the reason for this, in retrospect, was quite obvious. On the one hand, precisely because the Italians coveted territory which was held by Austria-Hungary, uh, Austria-Hungary and Germany were not in a position to offer nearly as much or weren't willing to offer nearly as much as the Allies could. The Allies were in this position of being able to promise enemy territory at the expense of their foes and thus could be far more expansive, far more generous, and ultimately won this competition. But the diplomacy had proceeded in secret, precisely, I think, because so many diplomats felt that the terms, if they became public, would just seem unseemly to too many people. The result was the signing of the secret Treaty of London between the Allies and Italy. This was signed on April 26, 1915. And the promises, while not very noble or idealistic, were extensive. Italy was promised ethnically Italian er areas, those places that were considered by Italian nationalists to be irredenta, the unredeemed ethnic territories where Italian speakers lived that were still under Austro-Hungarian rule in Trentino and Trieste, but also larger holdings of mixed population where fewer Italians might live, larger gains in Tyrol, in the mountainous areas, and the Dalmatian coast, and perhaps even new generous colonial gains in places like Asia Minor, 
currently held by the Ottoman Empire. Many of these promises professed the more exalted allied war aims of fighting for civilization and for the right of small nations uh, that we'll be discussing in a later lecture about war aims. But these secret promises would come back to haunt the allies. They would later be a liability in public relations terms when the terms became clear. Nonetheless, with these new gains, Italy now prepared to enter into the war. On May 23, 1915, Italy declared war on Austria-Hungary. Italian nationalists and figures who praised war like the romantic poet Gabriel D'Annunzio and futurist artists who had celebrated war as a form of necessary social hygiene and adventure all celebrated this arrival at last of Italian participation. Not all Italians felt so, but certainly these nationalists celebrated what one might call a delayed August madness. The war experience of Italians that soon followed would probably quell some of that celebration. Though Italian participation was thought to be a prize by the Allies who had bid so much for it, Italy, in fact, would soon discover that its fortunes in the war were not nearly so positive and it would soon require Allied assistance. The Italian commander, Count Luigi Cadorna, soon threw a million men into battle against Austria-Hungary on two fronts toward the Alpine areas bordering Italy in the north, Trentino, and towards Trieste across the Isonzo River to the east. In 11 battles, 11 battles on one spot on the Isonzo River, Italian forces attacked again and again and again, and yet were unable to break through enemy trenches. In 1916, the Italians took half a million casualties. A new kind of fighting also evolved in the Alps. And one of the themes of our course is, is the shock of the new. And in this case, this high altitude fighting represented novelty in military history. Guns and artillery had to be hauled up by pulleys to high vantage points dominating Alpine uh, vistas. Uh, in this battle, uh, glaciers could be turned into fortifications. And in fact, fighting took place on glaciers. Trenches and tunnels were built through the ice of glaciers in what came to be called by Italian forces the White War up in the snowy Alps. A war that for all of its modernity nonetheless could take primitive forms when rifles froze, soldiers would be reduced to throwing rocks at one another in this high Alpine frozen fighting. The Italian war effort took most definitely a turn for the worse with a great disaster, the defeat at Caporetto. In fall of 1917, German troops had been moved in to reinforce and help the Austro-Hungarians, something that was happening with increasing frequency as the Austro-Hungarian war effort faltered. Among those special troops who were moved in to help was a soldier who would later become a famous commander in World War II, Erwin Rommel, who had become famous as the desert fox of the German African forces in World War II. He and other German troops, together with the Austro-Hungarians, attacked the Italian lines. And in the Battle of Caporetto in October of 1917, often called the 12th Battle of the Isonzo, the Italian lines broke. A massive retreat set in, and it was only halted at last some distance away at the Piave River north of Venice. Entire Italian units simply surrendered. The Italians lost half a million casualties and a quarter million Italian prisoners were taken, testifying to a final breaking of morale. Ernest Hemingway's famous novel, A Farewell to Arms, talks precisely about this retreat, even though Hemingway himself had not experienced it. He arrived in the area six months later. It was very clear that the trauma of this experience was still present at the time. The retreat was halted as Italian forces finally regrouped 90 miles west of their initial positions at the Piave River to stand and defend the beautiful city of Venice. After this defeat, General Cadorna was replaced as commander-in-chief by General Armando Diaz, who didn't attempt any more foolhardy offensives and instead stood and the crisis passed. Meanwhile, matters were turning worse, it seemed, for the Allied forces in uh, other locations in the Balkans. Bulgaria had joined the Central Powers on September 6, 1915, in part because of the promises made to it by Germany and Austria-Hungary of winning Serbian territory. The conquest of Serbia would not only 
finally settle uh, the score that the Austro-Hungarians had initiated uh, uh, the conflict with, but also would ensure lines of communication open with the Turkish ally of the Central Powers. In the winter of 1915, German, Austro-Hungarian, and Bulgarian armies finally overran Serbia in the course of two months. The capital, Belgrade, was captured in January of 1916. The Central Powers also invaded Montenegro and moved into Albania. An Allied expedition, which tried to come to the aid of Serbia, found itself trapped in Salonika in Greece. In a dramatic and costly retreat, what's still remembered by Serbians as the Great Retreat, the Serbian army and the Serbian government and the Serbian king marched across the Albanian mountains through the harsh terrain and attacked by local forces, finally reaching the Adriatic Sea, where they were evacuated by Allied navies. It's estimated that in this horrendous retreat, Serbia lost tremendous casualties, and in the campaign as a whole, it lost a sixth of its population. Prematurely advan uh, impressed by Russian successes in the Brusilov offensive that we had mentioned in our previous lecture on the Eastern Front, Romania had, as it turns out with remarkably bad timing, entered the war on the Allied side in August of 1916, hoping that it might gain territory held by Austria-Hungary uh, in Transylvania, in particular, where Romanians lived uh, as a minority. Romania itself, however, rather than gaining these contested territories, found itself invaded a week later by the Central Powers. By December of 1916, the Central Powers, with uh, General Falkenhayn, who earlier had commanded the entire German war effort and who now had been demoted to a regional command uh, after General Hindenburg and Ludendorff had uh, achieved the supreme command in Germany as a whole, vindicated his military talents by helping in the conquest of Romania. Romanian oil and agricultural resources now fell to the central powers, and in terms of economic warfare, this turned out to be a significant gain. Uh, this was a case also where the action of secret agents turned out to be of importance as well, because British secret agents uh, set about sabotaging the oil fields of Romania immediately before they fell into the hands of the Central Powers. They set the oil fields on fire, and the result was that at least some of these natural resources were lost for the German forces. Finally, we turn to the disappointment of Salonika. The Allies had sought to aid Serbia in its embattled position, by sending in a military force through neutral Greece. Now, notice, please, the, the irony uh, of this situation. Uh, Britain and France, uh, among their war aims, had denounced German violation of Belgian neutrality. Uh, in this case, though they weren't explicit about it and tried to veil it, uh, another neutral country was finding its neutrality uh, infringed upon. Allied forces were moved to Greece by October of 1915, something that was quite controversial within Greece and Greek politics itself. The Greek Prime Minister Eleutherios Venizelos cooperated with the Allies in this venture, but because of the frustration and the displeasure of his king, was soon deposed. Venizelos, however, even after he was removed as Prime Minister, gathered opposition forces around himself and set up a rival government opposed to King Constantine, who was more pro-German, who was finally forced to abdicate as a result of this uh, pressure. As a result of this tremendously complicated maneuvering of internal politics within Greece and allied pressure from the outside, including something that many Greeks really resented, an allied blockade of Greece to bring it to its senses from their political perspective, at long last Greece joined the allies as a power, though not very enthusiastically, in June of 1917. However, even as forces had been poured into Salonika in preparation for a mission to relieve Serbia, the results were disappointing. These forces were unable to break through the Bulgarian lines to the north that now were making common cause with the Central Powers. And the result was that even though many forces had been poured into Salonika in order to aid this Balkan expedition, the result was that half a million Allied soldiers now found themselves trapped, idle, without a job, 
without an immediate military use. The Germans felt that Salonika was a grand joke, and they derisively called Salonika, in effect, the largest internment camp that the Central Powers had. The result was that this promise, this lure of finding a way to open another front that might have plunged into the Central Powers from below, from what Winston Churchill would later call the soft underbelly of Europe, and the Southern Front had been frustrated. The decision would have to come elsewhere, and in part that decision would come through a clearer articulation of what was at stake of the war in terms of war aims that we'll be discussing in our next lecture.